Hi everyone, uh, my name is Brian McDonald. I'm the Information Management uh, Officer with the Global CCM Cluster for IOM. And I am very happy to introduce you to the, today's breakout session on connectivity, energy, and sustainability. Um, our panel today um, contains uh, Jorn Kasper Orn. Sorry, Jorn, if I uh, butchered your name there. Uh, Christopher Hoffman, uh, also from NRC. Uh, Julio Kopi for, from NRC. Borja Gomez Rojo from NORCAP. And Joseph Wani from, uh, from NORCAP. And we're also joined by James Mwangi, um, who is uh, part of the nascent um, Connectivity, Energy and Sustainability Working Group. Um, some uh, housekeeping before we start. Can everyone hear me okay? If you want to wave, if you can hear me, fine. Great. Uh, so today's session is 65 minutes. Uh, we're going to... Um, we're going to start off by having a little uh, quiz to get your inputs and followed by three sessions, uh, one on uh, connectivity, one on energy and one on sustainability. Uh, we're then going to take the opportunity to discuss the uh, terms of reference and work plan for the uh, working group. Uh, so that will involve getting your, um, getting your inputs. Um, so I think to start off, I will share a little Mentimeter quiz. So bear with me while I get it set up. Okay, so um, we'll give, give everyone a moment to get set up. If you can open up your phones or your laptops and go to www.menti.com. And when it asks for a code, if you type in uh, 6620835. So when you type that in, it will give you a list of six questions um, covering a multitude of areas of connectivity, energy, and uh, sustainability. Uh, the first two questions are about ranking um, uh, ranking the um, benefits that you think of connectivity. And second one is also on uh a ranking one. So we'll just give everyone uh, around 30 seconds or so just to go through all six questions. So this quiz is to just kind of get an idea of everyone's uh, perceptions of these topics. Okay, the answers are starting to come in now. 13 responses, it's nearly everyone. Yeah, I think we can start going through them. Okay, so the first question on the ranking, uh, pretty close in terms of the uh, priority people give, give them. I'll share the, the results of this afterwards as well. So people, if you find it interesting, will be able to Reference it. Okay. Uh, 
So it'll ask you to go through all six questions one after another. Okay, the next one is on connectivity is a right. Well, quite an interesting uh, spread at the moment. I think this topic alone, we could have an entire separate session on. Yeah, it seems like, uh, yes, it should be open and free is taking the lead there. I was kind of surprised for it to be tied at the beginning. Okay. Question four, for whom is sustainable energy provision a higher priority? Okay, pretty, pretty high agreement on that one. That's a priority for both. Does sustainable camp management require increased large scale infrastructure or more individualized assistance? And finally, what do you see as the most viable and sustainable cooking fuel to be used in camps relevant cost availability and scale? Okay, so we'll leave these questions um, open if people uh, want to continue answering, answering them and we'll share the results uh, with you later. But we'd like to start with a presentation uh, by our first presenter, Christopher. So bear with me once while I get that up. Okay, can everyone see my slides? Okay, uh, please wave if you can, great. Yes. So the first presentation on connectivity, here's Christopher. Hello and welcome to this year's CCCM Global Retreat. My name is Chris Hoffman. I'm with the Norwegian Refugee Council as their global project manager for smart rapid response mechanisms which in truth really just centers around the fact of uh, having to look at how we do our responses and look at different digital solutions that can be applied. But one of the things that is the crux to everything that we do and what I believe and I think what we believe as a humanitarian community that's important is connectivity. Providing digital solutions in humanitarian settings is solely based on our ability to connect. Connect via phones, connect via data tools and the internet, and being able to connect uh, with our communities and the systems that we would like to operate uh, over a wide array of opportunities, either 4G networks, 3G networks, uh, Wi-Fi, hotspots, fiber optic, satellite, VSAT, etc. And one of the questions that we've started to ask ourselves and one of the questions that have not yet been answered yet is, is connectivity a right? Do people in need have a right to access connectivity? We know that the future, uh, not only because of COVID, but as we look towards the future of our engagement in communities is very much so based in the digital realm. And with social distancing that's come from uh, 
COVID-19 and then the pandemic, we also know that we have to be able to engage quite quickly and pivot quite quickly to be able to speak to those that are in need, be able to provide our services to those that are in need via digital means. Connectivity and the ability to connect to the internet or the ability to connect digitally in a number of different environments empowers communities to grow, empowers them to be able to have a voice, to be able to express their needs, to be able to express their concerns, and to be able to show to us the things that they think that they would like to have to be able to reach towards durable solutions in a faster way, uh, in being able to return home, uh, being able to be protected, feel protected, and be able to communicate their, their protection concerns um, using digital means. We know that it's important that connectivity is where we are and that people have access to it. One of the biggest questions that we're facing today is how to do it. We've had a number of different models that have been presented, whether models around fully subsidized um, by providing SIM cards and providing data um, to, to certain individuals and communities, Wi-Fi hotspots and internet cafes and allowing people to come and access the internet in a closed environment. Um, but what we're proposing today is to want to bring forward the discussion around new and innovative business models that can be applied in humanitarian settings. One of those models is what I want to present right now, which is what we call the airport model. All of us in the humanitarian community have traveled. We travel through airports throughout the world, some with really good connectivity and some with very bad connectivity. But one of the things that kind of stands true to all of them is that you access a front page when you enter the, the airport, uh, their airport Wi-Fi system. As you enter that front page, sometimes you have to watch a 15 second video on where to go to uh, access food. You might have to take a survey on the services that they provided. But in essence, you have to give something to get something back, which is that free Wi-Fi that you'd like to have. This airport model that we're proposing is similar to that, but facilitated by the NGOs and the United Nations agencies that are operating in these camp settings or camp-like settings, and then being able to provide a service back, which is uh, being able to provide the Wi-Fi access. So, for example, uh, we would offer uh, Wi-Fi hotspots throughout the, the camp, using a camp as, as, as a defined area. It's the easiest kind of example to use. And as we set up these Wi-Fi hotspots throughout the camp, as people go to those Wi-Fi hotspots and access the internet, we would ask them maybe a few questions through a survey, maybe show them a video on uh, an information video on GBV, um, maybe create some behavior change by uh, helping them to understand the effects of washing their hands and, and, and how it mitigates COVID-19 uh, propagation. Anything like that. And if we think about it in this way, any agency could do that. So WFP, for example, could have food messaging or food-related messaging. Um, UNHCR might have protection-related messaging. Uh, the government might actually have messaging around safety uh, in the camps, where to find police stations, etc. And so what would have to happen is a number of agencies and NGOs uh, and potentially the government would buy data bundles. And they would buy these data bundles and then they would buy a number of hits. So for example, Save the Children would come and want to buy 10,000 hits of a one minute video and that amount of data and the hours associated with that. So in general, that would be 10,000 hours of, of data up to a certain kind of limit. So let's say, you know, whatever that is, one terabyte of data. And they pay into this system and then NRC ourselves, we would do the same for legal services, and so we would all be working in an ecosystem of, of uh, seeking information uh, from the beneficiaries, either through a survey or something else, maybe just the amount of hits that we would have on a certain video. And then we would be giving the opportunity to access information, which is free at one hour of internet by, by taking the survey. And then every subsequent survey or every subsequent hour, you would have to take another, another survey or something like that. And this in general, uh, this general idea, we presented at NetHope uh, about two weeks ago, and th there's been a lot of feedback uh, on it. But what we're finding is, and UNHCR is, 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 is taking a, a role within this as well. What we're finding is, is that the policy is not there. Do we guard and fence it? Do we allow them to, would, would we just open up the internet for that one hour? They can access anything they want. Would we need to guard and fence it? Would we need to uh, direct the different sites that they're able to access? 
Would we actually have our own interface that they would have to access directly just to be supplied with information relevant to the camp uh, or, or where they are? So a lot of these questions haven't been answered and we've not as a community really come up with uh, the, the finite, this is what we can and can't do, this is what we should and shouldn't do uh, kind of guidance. And so we're really bringing this together um, here today with you and as we had at NetHope uh, two weeks ago and as we will for the next year. So for 2021, NRC will be uh, putting together what they call the Connectivity Collective, uh, which is a group of a number of different uh, industry uh, powerhouses that are in the connectivity space. Uh, some of the coalitions that are out there, such as uh, hopefully GSMA and others, uh, and, and you. And so we reach out to you to come and join this Connectivity Collective uh, to see that we can bring forward the discussion uh, around connectivity as a potential right uh, and as access to connectivity as a potential right and then how we're going to be able to design the business cases to do that. So you can always visit us at uh, connectivitycollective at nrc.no and come and talk to us there. Uh, and uh, I wish you all a, a great rest of your time at the CCCM Global Cluster Meeting. And uh, say hello to all my friends that are there. And, and, and I hope that you're, you're well and safe. And um, stay well and be well. Thanks. OK, so if anyone has any questions on any three of these presentations, please put them in the chat if you can. Or I can't find the chat myself. Um, if there isn't one, uh, feel free to um, raise them, un unmute yourself and raise them at the end of the third presentation. So move, oh, sorry. Next one. So the second presentation is going to be by um, Borja and, uh, and Joseph. So over to you guys. Thank you, Brian. Um, Thank you for, for organizing this uh, call. I'm going to be very quick in my introduction to Joseph, but I also wanted to uh, share what, uh, what is the effort that uh, NORCAP is uh, doing in, in, in energy. Uh, we have uh, been working in the energy topic uh, for two years and a half. Uh, it's a project funded by, by NORAD, and then we are focusing on three uh, different core, core areas and um, roughly more than half uh, of the total of the actions that we are doing uh, goes into improving access to clean energy for uh, for vulnerable people and uh, and then the, another another thing is uh, our focus in green humanitarian operations uh, and this is something that we are really growing in our ros roster uh, and then it's also improving coordination in the sector. So uh, I maybe you know already how the NORCAP uh, model uh, runs, and uh, I'm not going to go into detail. But missions uh, is what we call it. Uh, uh, usually has a, a, li a little bit of of uh, different aspects uh, covered uh, uh, in in their in their TORs. Um, just a quick snapshot. Uh, next slide, please. Quick snapshot of uh, our presence. Uh, we are uh, limited to the African continent, and this is uh, this has been our geographical expansions on the on the left. Uh, we deploy experts to uh, UN agencies and other humanitarian organizations. Uh, up to now, we work uh, quite strongly with the UNHCR, World Food Program, but uh, this is uh, growing. And uh, down there, you can also see the, the latest, um, the, the, the picture of, of the, our deployment in 2020, really aiming at uh, finishing close to 40 missions in end of this year. Uh, this is a quite of an achievement uh, for NORCAP in, in just a very short time. Uh, one of the persons that will be soon deployed by NORCAP in Zambia is our colleague, uh, Joseph, and I will be glad to give the mic and the floor to, to him. Thank you. Thanks, 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 Boha. Uh, yeah, so so basically today I will speak about uh, energy in humanitarian settings, uh, precisely on uh, uh, in emergence and uh, protected uh, settings before uh, concluding on um, clean energy as an, as an enabler in this space. Next slide. So, uh, it, so, so my 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 discussion will be more 
with respect to uh, to UNHCR uh, mode of operation. So you'd realize that in, uh, in UNHCR uh, policy on emergency preparedness and response focuses or is anchored more on uh, early investment in preparedness for an effective response to, to emergencies. So the aspect of uh, preparedness actually includes the uh, assessment and planning as part and parcel of their of uh, UNHCR operations management cycle. So I will talk much about the, the cycle later uh, in, my, in, my, in my presentation. Um, so then, then the next, next aspect to, to, to note is also the fact that at present moment, UNHCR uses uh, HALEP to track early warning and monitor preparedness. And uh, as we speak right now, you, um, the Energy and Environment Unit of uh, DRA is in, um, uh, in UNHCR HQ is working on uh, ensuring that uh, energy access and connectivity are adequately covered in, uh, in HALEP because as, as, as at the moment, they are not really covered. So there is a uh, progress towards that so that we ensure that uh, the NFIs, the uh, core relief items, uh, you know, uh, includes everything we need as far as address addressing the energy needs of our targeted audience. So that is meant to cascade down to country operations and, uh, and bureaus to ensure that their contingency plans totally you know, include all these um, uh, energy access and, con and uh, connectivity aspects, which are very important. So the response as well, uh, even during emergency in UNHCR, you notice that it is also um, it also follows the, the same operations management cycle, uh, but uh, in, uh, in, in, in an emergency, you would realize that it will be uh, sort of optimized in, in ensuring that we respond promptly. So the turnaround times are reduced and also some of the bureaucratic process, which, are, which actually you know, happens in uh, protracted settings are shortened to ensure that the response is, uh, is in time. And finally, uh, uh, the division of emergency a support uh, services is the one really uh, uh, responsible for the operation for the operationalization of uh, of Alep. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, the uh, you know the the, the one before uh, energy in a protracted settings. So in 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 in. Uh, UNHCR, you'd realize that the setup is all confined to the operation management cycle, which I've been referring to. And um, in our space of energy, uh, uh, UNHCR has actually de uh, developed three guidelines, which are really aligned to, to this cycle. And also, you know, the protection component, which is the main mandate of, uh, of UNHCR. And uh, I would Put uh, dwell much on uh, cooking and 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 lighting as the key aspects, you know, which we found we find ourselves to to address uh, both in an emergency uh, setup and also in protracted settings. So yeah, so the the, the 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 drive behind these guidelines is to ensure that in developing cooking solutions, we take note of the fact that it is essential to consider the the food types of the targeted audience, their preferences their cooking practices, uh, as well as the available resources in terms of what is available locally, level loads opportunities, uh, sustainability factors, uh, efficiency, protection, and, um, and health risks, which comes with uh, you know, addressing the issue of, uh, of cooking. So I'm sure most of you are aware of the you know, respiratory health issues, which comes with uh, cooking in the kitchen and also in general, the use of uh, you know, fossil fuels in addressing this aspect of cooking. So it's something which is really of concern and addressed in, uh, in these uh, guidelines which are to be published very soon. And the other thing is the, uh, the sexual and gender-based violence which comes with uh, access to cooking fuel. In some instances, you'll find that uh, women, men, boys and girls travel long distances. In some instances, they go to unsafe places to, to fetch firewood. So that, that, that protection risk is also a thing of concern addressed in the, in the, in, in the guidelines and the, also the, some injuries which comes with uh, 
using some of the existing technologies in cooking, which our persons of concern find themselves having to, to make use of. So uh, the environmental issues, which also comes with that, these are some of the issues. And also to address even the, the conflicts with host, usually with host communities over the limited cooking fuel uh, and uh, energy sources. You are aware again of the greenhouse, you know, gas emissions that contribute to, to global warming, climate change, and occurrence of natural disasters. Already in Indonesia now, it's we are talking loud about uh, climate induced displacement. So all these, the list goes on uh, in terms of what we really need to to address with uh, with these guidelines on lighting. We have noted uh, mainly from the say from the start project that. Uh, in our space, uh, the main purpose of lighting, uh, I would say, is to provide an environment that enables individuals to perform specific tasks safely and uh, also to extend the time available for work and entertainment. Uh, also noting that it is also vital for security. Uh, to an extent that from a technical point of view, we recognize that uh, sustainable lighting systems depend not only on uh, providing the right lighting levels in terms of illuminancy, uh, for the task, but also selecting an efficient lighting source, uh, optimizing the lighting controls, and also utilizing uh, daylight. So to an extent that uh, this is meant to, in, uh, rather in recognition of the fact that, you know, nighttime activities are difficult to do in darkness. That's something which we have uh, seen in uh, most, uh, you know, uh, camps we are working in. Lack of lights cause, causes potential threats and uh, SJBV issues, which I have already uh, alluded to. So the, it's also a long list, which also comes with that. So in to make sure that this uh, will continue to be to be addressed going forward, there is there are also positive developments happening right now in uh, in DRS towards. Uh, improving energy programming, recognizing that it's a cross-cutting thing and enabler. So the current uh, tools, that is the programming tools for, uh, which, uh, which, which will be used for the operation management cycle are being um, updated to ensure that they are holistic and uh, integrated to include uh, ev uh, you know, all the cross-cutting you know, aspects like uh, energy and, uh, and, and environment. So it's, it's something which is happening and we are making all the efforts to ensure that you know we energy will not be sidelined in both uh, uh, emergency and uh, protracted settings. Next slide. So now, I, so this is the the operations uh, uh, management cycle, which governs uh, uh, our operations both in uh, emergency and protracted settings. So it goes from assessments, planning, implementation, monitoring reporting and the auditing, which comes with that evaluation. And then we learn from the evaluation, feeding that to, you know, the next, you know, cycle of uh, assessment. And that keeps on going as the, you know, the situation on ground uh, changes. Next slide. So on the next slide, it's just a picture of showing you, you know, what is happening. Uh, so recently, early this year, we finished uh, you know some uh, feasibility studies with uh, uh, with uh, with IRENA to just look at the you know the the energy needs and the you know supply options for two camps in Ethiopia and uh, two camps in, uh, in 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 Iraq so the the point here is just to emphasize the need of uh, of assessments so because we, we need to do some measurements to really in this in this regard we're actually trying to get the demand profiles in terms of uh, the electricity consumption so that we can really analyze how that relates to the fuel consumption, how that re relates to our energy intensities to really question whether we are, are you know, using uh, you know, more energy as expected or, or we are being inefficient. It on, we can only reach that level of analysis or discussion when we have got the data. So that's, that's, that's one thing which we are trying to address there. Next slide. And, the, and this one is just to show the situation on ground. This is one project, uh, ra 4 r which we are doing in partnership with uh, Practical Action and also NRC. And uh, one observation from, from that project that you see, uh, because of lack of uh, lighting, this is what some of our shelters are like, 
where they are actually, you know, improvising to come up with their, you know, used batteries, they align them in series, just get a torch bulb somewhere there and, you know, put it on the roof there, just because they want to address the issue of, 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 of lighting. So these are the kind of things, these are the kind of shelters we have and uh, just emphasizing the need of us to respond urgently. Next slide. So the point is energy in humanitarian settings is, I mean, is required. We need it everywhere. It's, it's I've already alluded to the fact that it's cross cutting. It enables things to happen in, 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 in all aspects. So once we recognize that and then make ensure that going forward, we do all we can to ensure that at any particular moment in all our assessments, in all our planning, in all our interventions and practices, we ensure that you know um, energy is required to make things happen. Next slide. So the next slide is showing the same thing. Uh, you know, the point maybe I want to emphasize here is, is, is that uh, access to energy is actually a basic need as well as uh, an enabler for meeting a variety of other needs with an impact on a number of human rights and uh, interventions should be designed from a rights-based approach. Uh, besides enhancing the use of uh, cleaner and more sustainable energy sources, the motive should actually be to save lives and uh, reduce the consumption, that is the fuel or energy consumption by enabling the use of uh, more efficient technologies and also promoting energy conserving practices. So that's, that, 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 that should be the sequence and that's the kind of drive which we are trying to, you know, to enhance through the, the three energy guidelines which uh, uh, Unishara has de developed and will be published uh, very soon. Next slide. So in conclusion, uh, our practice uh, in, in this space precisely in UNHCR should reflect on ground that energy is a, is a cross-cutting. It is not an end in itself, but a means to an end. We need it and we need to ensure that it is uh, addressed at all costs. And uh, I would also want you to, you know, to make use of the clean energy challenge marketplace, which is uh, under uh, our Clean Energy Challenge, uh, uh, co-chaired by GPA and UNHCR, where we are inviting, you know, um, uh, proposals, uh, ready projects to implement, you know, to address energy needs in this space. So we are doing everything to bring in all the the players, both private uh, players and, you know, public uh, players who are really, you know, uh, aiming to make sure that uh, we address, you know, our energy issues in an, in an uh, in a sustainable way. So make use of that space. If uh, you have the needs to be addressed, that space is there and it's really promising and it's really our future. So in conclusion, uh, that's, that's, that's what I would say to kick up uh, the discussion. So for now, I will hand over to, uh, to Yon. <coughs> Thanks a lot for very interesting perspectives. Um, and uh, we will uh, go back to the questions uh, later, but uh, we are uh, holding this session today because uh, displacement patterns are changing. Demographic growth uh, makes more displaced people reside in uh, densely populated uh, areas and cities, and um, they are increasingly accessing new technology. They're increasingly in need of uh, energy uh, for this. Uh, we're not here to discuss um, the positive or negative impact of uh, connectivity or nor the um, digital divides, the the gaps in computer literacy because we're here to engage uh, CCM practitioners in building a better understanding of the impact of connectivity and the impact of energy in uh, displacement management. Uh, we um, clearly see that uh, 
connectivity is, uh, as I <laughs> often say, climbing on uh, Maslow's needs pyramid. Uh, it's becoming uh, closer and closer to a human right because it's connected to access to uh, your rights-based services. It's uh, connected to your um, uh, possibility of uh, communicating with your family and your place of origin. Uh, this has uh, a tremendous impact on uh, on uh, displacement in itself. An uh, example from Moria last year was that um, uh, we had a, uh, a killing in the camp and uh, the day after it resulted in uh, clashes between uh, two uh, villages in Afghanistan. Uh, is that an effect of uh, connectivity? Is it um, is it something uh, which is our task to work on? Um, those kind of questions will have to be uh, also part of the work of this uh, working group. Um, and uh, as Joseph uh, clearly shows us, uh, the clean energy is a cross-sectoral enabler. Every services, every service, every delivery we do uh, is somehow depending on uh, energy and that energy should be clean. Uh, increasingly the, the people residing in uh, our sites uh, are using energy and uh, it has a huge impact on everything from a little girl uh, being able to study that to um, Unpolluted, uh, uh, unpolluted uh, shelters uh, where uh, where we are uh, better able to address health issues and so on. And some of this work is about aligning to the um, to the UN Sustainability Strategy, uh, where we need to understand the impact of uh, these topics on uh, CCM work and we need to find and identify some uh, durable uh, uh, now some uh, some ambitions and some uh, milestones to to engage in i really plan to share a presentation Brian but uh, if you stop uh, stop sharing then i can share uh, okay, so um, uh, voila. So um, we uh, very keenly invite your questions uh, and uh, your thoughts, and also the experiences you have had uh in these regards in your in your daily work and uh to be able to kind of uh, assess and evaluate uh, all the different solutions that are available within uh, these uh, areas uh, we would like to introduce quickly the sustainable settlements approach as a way of understanding available um available solutions. So uh, connectivity is definitively uh, becoming uh, increasingly important uh, and, uh, and we need to understand how we relate to it. The impact of our big operations uh, are, uh, are significant both when it comes to energy consumptions uh, and um, gas emissions and uh, waste and uh, air pollution we travel a lot we operate big operations with uh, uh, big logistics uh, needs we uh, we use uh, of course a lot of technology and ICT and uh, this uh, this has uh, a significant impact on uh, on the environment uh, for this um, 
uh, working group, we uh, would uh, like to see uh, your experiences and case studies uh, and what you have been developing in the field to, um, to take part of uh, our uh, ambitions uh, for the future. We uh, would like to assess them and uh, understand them to provide uh, better examples of what is available for you as practitioners. And we would, of course, then uh, like to bring in all relevant partners and uh, other actors uh, that may uh, support and may help us uh, develop uh, to meet future displacement needs. Um, these are some of the um, relevant partners, the Global Plan of Action and uh, the Environmental Emergency Center. And we will also link this work closely to the Global Shelter Cluster uh, Environment Community of Practice. Uh, if some of you don't know the history about <laughs> the name of uh, or the previous name of this working group, the ARC, it is because the, the deteriorating environment uh, is about to force us all to jump onto an ARC and uh, and uh, save ourselves, <laughs> but uh, make sure that we is, is remain relevant uh, and uh, jump onto this working group. Uh, quickly about the Sustainable Settlements, it's a publication that you can access through this link. It is a way of assessing uh, different sides of fiscal interventions and also linking it to what kind of impact it has on uh, the social infrastructure in uh, displacement settings. Uh, it provides a kind of a platform of understanding uh, to see the impact of uh, how we use resources may be reduced by alleviating waste which will then also lead to improved uh, economic sustainability. And uh, uh, it includes understanding of how our use of materials can also benefit things as uh, livelihood opportunities and uh, other approaches that uh, uh, affects the social sustainability of our operations. Uh, it goes uh, quite in depth on the different areas and uh, focuses on reducing uh, the loss and the waste. And it gives a methodology to um, assess different solutions because all of us are exposed to new ideas, new private partners that come up with solutions. But how do we assess them? How can we understand what are the solutions that are adaptable in the contexts we work, what are the effects of including such solutions. So it's it's also a tool to, it's a, it's a methodology to support the assessment of this and it's also, it's also providing very useful tools to understand. Uh, yeah. Brian, we, uh, we're, in, we're in a hurry and um, we need to focus on the way forward. But uh, first of all, we want to welcome you all to contribute to the working group. Um, Jorn, do you want to do some quick uh, questions and answers? I know there's been a couple of questions in the chat. If you want to have uh, one question for each of our panelists. Yeah. Um, Pierre, uh, on energy, how do we make um, uh, connectivity effective in rural settings without energy power? So the question would then both be on uh, connectivity, but uh, more on how do we ensure to provide power in uh, rural settings, whether it's uh, uh, yeah, Joseph uh, and James, please um, give your thoughts on it. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah, obviously, I mean, as, as, as I've alluded to in my presentation, energy is an enabler. We, we need it everywhere. And uh, so that we can, you know, access connectivity and make even all uh, sectors of the economy to function. Even in our case where we are worried about, you know, household energy needs, energy for productive uses, energy for uh, for our businesses for you know for 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 livelihoods we, we we just need to you know to make sure that we are really loyal and serious about sdg7 and uh, try to you know to come up with innovative ways you know to to get energy there there are a lot of now public private uh, you know partnerships or mechanisms which the you know the se for all team is initiated to just ensure that you know we get energy everywhere and even in our space we've i've spoken about the clean energy challenge which is linked to the global sustainable uh, energy strategy for unhcr if you look at all that the effort is just to ensure that in our space we've got energy uh, which will enable connectivity and all these other aspects i have mentioned to be to be addressed so yeah in short uh, i will leave it there and i don't know james you can Add one or two things. Over. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Joseph. Um, actually, essentially, Joseph has uh, touched on more or less everything. So, essential. So, energy is becoming increasingly important because we're then looking at the sustainability from a perspective of, of um, at the at the, at the camp settings, as to how we can then link up all these seemingly separate entity issues into one sort of cohesive, um, uh, sort of issue. Um, because previously we've been planning them separately in silos um, within different sectors, but then I think, but with the, the energy as an enabler, we look at the cross-cutting nature of it and how we can then connect all the, the various uh, um, sectors in order to ensure that right from the program, within the program management cycle, we're able to plan for, with that in mind from the onset. Um, so this has clearly been uh, indicated by Joseph and then recently actually OCHA has also released some some guidelines, uh, actually very recently, I think just this week, in terms of looking at energy as a critical enabler in terms of uh, displacement settings. And therefore, therefore, even greater thrust is being brought upon uh, this particular sector. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and we do have a lot of solutions available uh, from the household level with the solar lamps providing uh, cell phone energy up to hubs connected to services in the camps, uh, close to very local grids and uh, all the way up to connecting to the larger grids as we've seen in, uh, in um, Jordan, for example. Uh, Chris, on um, the questions related to the airport model, uh, related to data protection and also uh, the <laughs> percentage of phones currently uh, in camps, uh, could you please comment on that? Sure, yeah, just relatively quickly. So on the data protection, yes, a huge concern. Yes, very, very easily addressed. So it's just about uh, what we use as the back end and where we put it and what we agreed to. And I think that's where a lot of the, the policy discussions need to, to have um, a silo around data protection, how we do it, GDPR, et cetera. Uh, on the next piece um, around usage, Absolutely correct, um, but that should not stop us. You know, we we have this kind of tendency as humanitarians to always want to reach every single person, and I think sometimes we need to take the good enough approach and start to address the needs as we can, and then build our programming around that to to further address other vulnerabilities or other issues. So, point well taken. Point very true, uh, but at the same time, I think as we see, Kenya is a great example of when there were no cell phones and five years later, 70% of the population had cell phones, you know, in mm. the general population, I think we would see growth quite quickly and exponentially if we were able to provide a service that was useful. Um, so that's just market economics, you know, if it's useful, people will use it. And so that's that's upon us to ensure that what we design is correctly targeted and correctly designed for, for the user themselves. Yeah, thanks. And, and what the future holds remains to be seen, but uh... What is very clear is that we have to understand and relate to connectivity and energy in the future of our planning. Um, so, please contribute with your uh, thoughts and uh, your engagement to this work group. Uh, Brian, do you want to take us through the... Sure, yeah. 
Um, if people, we're going to use the last couple of minutes to gather people's inputs into what should be the work plan for this um, working group over the next 12 months. Uh, so if people can go on to menti.com and the code for this one is uh, 12038698. So just while you're doing that, a little bit of background on the working group. Uh, the working group was... Um, it was proposed by Jorn at last year's retreat, such a long time ago. Um, mm -hmm. And since then, we've we've been working on uh, putting together terms of reference. And in March, um, during our kind of week of COVID webinars, we uh, we put together a webinar on this topic, and it was to kind of bring awareness to a lot of these other uh, initiatives that are ongoing. So um, what we want to kind of use this session as is to, um, to really finalize that TOR so we can launch the, the working group in, in the coming weeks. And like, we really need your inputs on uh, what are the kind of priority activities from your perspectives as you know, camp management uh, personnel and just to really shape it. And when we get, sent back to the other breakout, I'm going to share a form where uh, we just ask you to put in your email address and name if you're interested in, in uh, participating in that working group. Uh, so we'll just add you to the mailing list. Um, but yeah, for now, just please add in uh, what you think are the uh, priority activities um, in the next 12 months. And I think you can put in multiple uh, answers there. So there's no harm to put in some really ambitious ones, but also um, some that are uh, that reflected the resources and the uh, the time scale as well would be good. I'll uh, I'll maximize the screen so we can see it a little bit better. Bear with me. Uh. We, it seems we can uh, keep on until uh, four o'clock. Yeah, that's great. It gives us another on the five side minutes. channel here. So please do. Uh, and on that, um, we uh, we really need your input because uh, there there is such a constant development of solutions and. Um, private initiatives within these fields of work and uh, and of course it's not our develop our work to be web developers but we need to understand what is uh, available and also how it affects the populations we are here to help um yeah now you are working well it's uh, coming in a lot of interesting thoughts it's really good. I'm seeing a couple on assessments and and w one or two on collecting tools, a sort of compendium. Mm -hmm. I think those two things are well within reach for the, the group in the coming year. Yeah. And also with regards to the financing, because uh, we know from operations that when we buy a car, we are able to split that in uh, in four funding cycles, but when we install a solar system, then uh, we haven't come there yet to, to make uh, installations uh, financially viable, uh, even though they are saving us a lot of, uh, of money. So, so deep diving into that is also very interesting topics. I suppose I should mention we're working on the, the next edition of the CCM case studies at the moment. I know we have one um, we have one case study around, I think, energy and sustainability. But just if anyone has other good examples that they think are worth putting a case study together for around um, connectivity, uh, sustainability or en energy or regarding CCM, uh, feel free to reach out to us. I think we could definitely squeeze more in there. Like we know there is a lot of these uh, best practices and innovations happening in the field. And there is perhaps um, we're lacking in terms of taking those good examples and kind of sharing them with the wider CCM community. Mm. 
And also an important topic uh, for us as uh, camp uh, workers, we we know that when we implement fiscal infrastructure, like for example, if we want a waste management system, uh, we can put solar cells on top of it. Uh, that could uh, be a barrier between uh, single men and uh, families with children, or it could be a way to channel the rotation in the camp to avoid uh, to, to enable social distancing. We, we can use this infrastructure also to support the work we normally do. And uh, treatment of grey water is a source of livelihood opportunities uh, and so on. Seen someone putting in funding as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, someone will have to work the rooftop of the donors, uh, but uh, but I'm sure that for future proposals, uh, environment and sustainability will uh, almost have to be streamlined. You can't uh, submit proposals without uh, addressing these topics uh, anymore. Okay, I think it's about time to uh, to wrap up our session. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, yeah, are we just thrown back? I think we'll get transported back to the main group in a couple of seconds. But Jorn, do you want any closing remarks? Thanks, and please engage. Uh, this is the future. Stay relevant and uh, work on these topics with Brian and me, and Joseph and uh, James. Now we're being uh, thrown back. See you there. Okay, thank you very much, everybody.